our first our first speaker. Our topic is the fossil record is more compatible with the model of creation than the model of evolution. Our first speaker is Dr. Don Hatton. We thank you for coming. We thank uh, for you for the opportunity to be here and to, to address this group, providing the room for us, and uh, we appreciate that. The fossil record is one of my favorite subjects and has been for a long time. Uh, as a geologist, I've been accused of having rocks in my head from time to time, uh, but we enjoy that kind of thing. Many people foolishly believe, at least in my estimation, that the fossil record belongs to evolutionists and supports evolution. Uh, my experience, uh, my evaluation of the evidence is that is by no means the case, but rather that the fossils provide uh, direct positive evidence for a sudden complex beginning. But first, if we're going to find evidence for evolution, we have to have evidence from the fossils. This is where it's at, if you please. S.M. Stanley of Johns Hopkins University made this statement, it's doubtful whether in the absence of fossils the idea of evolution would represent anything more than an outrageous hypothesis. The fossil record, and only the fossil record, provides direct evidence of major sequential changes in the Earth's biota. Obviously, there's evidence in other areas, but direct evidence that would uh, support a firm conclusion, I think, would have to come from the fossils. But let's also notice this about evidence from the fossils from John Horner. Many of you uh, saw Jurassic Park, the character that that film was based on, the fellow digging up dinosaurs up in uh, Montana, <clears throat> was Jack Horner. He says in his book, Dinosaur Lives, paleontology is a historical science a science based on circumstantial evidence after the fact, and we can never reach hard and fast conclusions. History doesn't reach the kind of conclusions that hard science reaches. He says these days it's easy to go through school for a good many years, sometimes even through college, without ever hearing that some sciences are historical or by nature inconclusive. So this is the evidence, the only direct evidence, but it's not conclusive evidence even so. But I think there's a strong indication given from the fossil record. One of the ways co to compare contrasting models is to make predictions and to see which one is fulfilled best when we look at the actual evidence. Regarding the fossil record, there are obviously very dramatically contrasting predictions that would be made uh, by both. The evolutionist, when he's looking at the beginning of the fossil record, which would probably be the most critical aspect of it, uh, would predict a simple, gradual, linked group of fossils at the beginning of the fossil record, whereas the creationist predicts exactly the opposite, a complex, abrupt, diverse group at the beginning. Now, those two are so dramatically different that we should have no trouble looking at the fossil record to see which one is served best by the evidence. In the continuing record, the evolutionist would predict similarities, uh, branching pattern of similarities due to common ancestry, an allied continuum, a progression, one leading to the other, whereas the creationist would predict similarities due to common designer. It's reasonable to expect similar forms uh, or common forms from, from, uh, from common uh, origin, uh, common designer, uh, similar forms for similar functions but it would be in a mosaic pattern, not a branching pattern, as the designing artist would put a blue tile here and a blue tile there, depending on whether it's needed, but not connected or branching. They would be separate and distinct. Stasis would be the order of the day rather than progression. That's how you would distinguish between what's going on in terms of evolution. That's different. Again, you should be able to look and tell which one is served best by the evidence? Well, how will we look and tell? I can tell you what the fossil record is, uh, what it, uh, the nature of it, and many would say, well, you're prejudiced as one who believes in creation. The method that I'm going to be using is that of quotes from the antagonistic witness, from those who are devout believers in evolution. Now, John has had a 
a little hard time getting this concept in previous lectures and what he's written up after I spoke indicates that this has not sunk in. So let's, let's work on this concept a minute so we understand it. When you have testimony from a friendly witness who testifies in court saying the accused is honest or the accused uh, has no reasonable motive, then that will certainly help. But if you can elicit testimony from an antagonistic witness, then the same testimony takes on much greater weight. If this one who believes the fellow is guilty, obviously, says, well, yes, I admit he's honest, and I admit there's no reasonable motive, then that is much weightier testimony. Friendly testimony helps, but what the lawyer calls acknowledgments contrary to interest are much more weighty, and that's what we'll be using. I don't want anyone to misunderstand. These witnesses are evolutionists. They're devout believers in evolution. They're men of great faith in evolution. Let's not... Now, now when you listen to some of the things they say, you'll, you'll think, well, now, he's quoting a creationist. No, I, let's not... I don't want to leave that impression. I want that clear. Here's an example. Richard Dawkins is one of the most ardent anti-creationist in the world, from Ox uh, actually from Oxford and Cambridge. He says we find many of them, speaking of the fossil record, already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. Now, it's a state of evolution. He believes that. But it's not because there's an evolutionary history. It's because of his faith, because when they appear, they're advanced. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted the creationist, and I'll plead guilty there. That's what we would predict, and that's another way of saying this is not what we predict. It is what they predict, which is the way we test models. National Geographic had an article uh, just a couple of years ago on the lowest layer of the geologic column, when you look in this column where the life begins, below the Cambrian you've got some blue-green algae and bacteria, but when it really starts, it starts in an explosion, and that's the way they depict it. Stephen Gould, a very devout evolutionist of Harvard, said, describes it this way, the Cambrian explosion occurred in a geological moment. We have reason to think that all major anatomical designs may have made their evolutionary appearance at that time. Now, he has great faith that it was an evolutionary appearance. Why? Well, not because there's any record of evolution there. When they appeared, uh, when it started, you have all the major anatomical designs. In fact, he says we have more, had more then than we have now. It's gone downhill, as we'll see. Not only the phylum chordata itself, but also all its major divisions. That's us, that's the animals with backbones, not saying that we were in the, the Cambrian, but animals with backbones, our, uh, our phylum was represented at the very beginning. We're looking, I think, at an environment at the bottom of the ocean. We wouldn't predict everything lived at the bottom of the ocean. He says, since the so-called Cambrian explosion, no new phylum of animals have entered the fossil record. Now, there were more then. We've gotten less now and no new ones. But they were all, all that we have now were there when the explosion took place. Now, according to the evolutionists themselves, the antagonistic witnesses then, we have those beginnings complex and suddenly right at the start. They're advanced as if they were just planted there. Again, this is not the, the creationist. This is the evolutionist. We won't have time in this presentation to document all of this. It will be documented in the handout that's available at the back. Sometimes we're told in the textbooks that nothing but shallow seas anywhere in the Cambrian. Well, we've got 60 genera of land plants, including six vascular plants, or woody plants, trees. We also have all the major anatomical designs, the chordata, all its major divisions. We have vertebrates from dozens of states. And we have, since the Cambrian, no new phyla. Now, I couldn't have written that better myself. When we think about what's predicted and what we find, uh, that's pretty delightful as far as the creationists are concerned. Uh, the predictions are fulfilled. They are contradicted with evolution. Yet this is what we've got in the textbooks. That's not what we have in the fossil record. In fact, Gould says that. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. 
The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. In fact, he indicates in his book, Wonderful Life, that if you turn it upside down, it's closer because you've got more then than you've got now, and it's gone downhill. He says the sweep of anatomical diversity reached a maximum right after the initial diversification of multicellular animals. Now, he believes that there was this evolutionary diversification, but what he sees is the maximum diversity right at the start, as if they were just planted there. The later history of life preceded by elimination, not expansion. And then he has some chapter, uh, a chapter actually ridiculing the idea of this cone of diversity, as he refers to it, which is predicted by the evolutionist, this simple beginning that gradually progresses upward and gets more diverse. He says, no, the diversity was greater at the beginning, and it has gone downhill. Now, it doesn't take somebody real bright to understand which of the two models is served best by that evidence as acknowledged by the antagonistic witness. It's the opposite of what we see in the textbooks. Well, where did this come from? Well, the textbooks have this because of the assumption of evolution. This is the way it ought to be, and so that's the way it's drawn. As Gould says, it is not the evidence of the fossils. He says, uh, or Roger Lewin, the editor of Research and News and Science, writing in his book, Bones of Contention, tells us how this tree of life is put together. There is a fundamental basic assumption. The key issue is the ability to correctly infer genetic relationship between two species on the basis of a similarity in appearance. And then they line up the similarities according to this tree, beginning, of course, with the simplest at the bottom. But the basis of this is similarity. That's how they put it, not because of the fossils. He acknowledges this is deceptive, though he believes in the system, partly because similarity of structure does not necessarily imply identical genetic heritage. A shark, which is a fish, a porpoise, which is a mammal, look similar. When we see these two fish, they look similar. And if you agreed with that statement, I caught you because while they look like fish, neither of them are. One's a reptile, one's a mammal, neither are fish. But they look similar, but they're not kin. And so this is not a consistent principle. And when we look at Critters like the platypus, by this principle, he's kin to almost everybody. He's got a bill like a duck and webbed feet. He's got claws uh, with fangs that inject venom, lays eggs like a reptile. He has fur like a beaver. Uh, he, the old adage is that which proves too much proves nothing. When you look at the whole picture of similarities, and we need to look at similarities when we're talking about fossils because that's how you line them up. Without the association based on similarities, you have no, the, the, the fossils don't say anything. They're just a bunch of dead things and rocks. And so based on the similarities, they're able to line them up. And yet this basis is very inconsistently applied. Some similarities, just some, many are ignored. We look at blood serum, the chimpanzee is very similar. In fact, with the right antiserum, you can actually interchange at times. But when you look at milk chemistry, not so. The donkey is much closer than the chimpanzee. When you look at cholesterol, well, lo and behold, the garter snake has cholesterol like we do. In terms of foot structure, which we've been interested in in uh, our work down at Glen Rose, what's similar to the human foot? Some footprints look like human feet. Well, the glacial bear is closest, not the ape. He's got a hand for a foot, doesn't he? Now, with the glacial bear, his uh, hands are reversed, the thumbs are on the outside, and got claws in the quadruped, you don't confuse the two, but you take the claws off and the skin off and the flesh, and wow, that looks like a human foot, a lot more than the ape does. The chicken has tear enzyme like, well, it is, lidosome, we have that in our eyes to help fight bacteria. The chicken needs it in the egg to fight bacteria. Very, very complex protein. Uh, Blood antigen A, lo and behold, you find that in the butter bean. In terms of brain hormone, <laughs> amazingly, the cockroach has the same brain hormone we have. Notice this from Discover Magazine. Don't squash that roach, he may be your cousin. Uh, cockroach and man, it seems, share a common brain hormone. 
we see similarities, but this is not a branching pattern that we're looking at here. We're looking at that mosaic pattern of similarities. When you look at the whole picture, it often looks very different. The evidence, the fossil record, the only direct evidence, has a critical beginning that is complex, abrupt, diverse, all the phyla there, more than we got now, none you sense. These trees of life are from selected similarities. They are not from the fossils. The similarities reveal a mosaic pattern, not a branching pattern. When we proceed then in the fossil record, notice the description again by the antagonistic witness, Stephen Gould, who devoutly believes in evolution. We can tell tales of improvement for some groups, but in honest moments we must admit that the history of complex life is more a story of multifarious variation about a set of basic designs than a saga of accumulating excellence. Now, I told you you'd think some of these were creationists, but they're not. He talks of designs which he doesn't believe in, but that's what it looks like, and you catch him using the term uh, from time to time in maybe honest moments, as he put it. This is the picture that we see rather than the progression. Darwin understood this problem. Many people think Darwin was convinced by the fossil record. From Origin of the Species, we read innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? And why is not every geological formation, every stratum full of such intermediate links? Uh, he says that's not the case. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the greatest objection which can be urged against my theory. A lot of people think that Darwin was bolstered by and encouraged by the fossil record. He studied it a great deal. No, this, he said, was the greatest problem. This is delightful to the creationist, but it's a problem for the evolutionist. Many would say, well, that was back then. It's gotten better. No, it's gotten worse. David Rapp of the Field Museum of Natural History, he's the senior uh, curator of uh, uh, invertebrate paleontology. This is the largest fossil museum in the United States says Darwin was completely aware of this. He was embarrassed by the fossil record. We're delighted. They're embarrassed. One fits the predictions, one doesn't. This is their description because it didn't look the way he predicted it would. Well, he says, we're now about 120 years after Darwin. The knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. It goes on to mention several that are often touted in the textbooks, like the, the horse series and Archaeopteryx and some of those. Uh, it's gotten worse, and we've lost some of the ones that we thought we had. Derek Ager, when, the time, when this was written, was president of the British Geological Association says it must be significant that nearly all of the evolutionary stories I learned as a student have now been debunked. Uh, the textbooks don't always tell us that. D.B. Kitts says evolution requires intermediate form. This is the way you would see evolution. Paleontology does not provide them. The fact that discontinuities are almost always and systematically present. Now, they can be there because of random sampling, but this is systematic, he says. Uh, this is genuine historical knowledge. S.M. Stanley of Johns Hopkins says the fact the fossil record does not convincingly document a single transition. Now, you'll find people with pages of these transitions and put them on a page and saying their transitions doesn't make them so. Those who would love to say otherwise, the antagonistic witness says there's not one. Stewart says our faith postulates its existence, but the faith, the, the type, uh, fails to materialize. Corner says to the unprejudiced, the fossil record is in favor of special creation. Why? Well, it's complex, abrupt, diverse, all the phyla at the beginning. Uh, we have that which delights the creationist, embarrasses the evolutionist. It was Darwin's biggest problem, worse now. Uh, the links, one by one, have been debunked. Uh, they certainly devoutly believe in evolution, but they acknowledge even in their own words that the fossils favor creation. There's good reason for that. That's not Sunday school material. That's the fossils. That's the evidence, the facts. And that's why I think the fossil record favors creation, because of the evidence, uh, primarily from those who are devout evolutionists who would love to say otherwise, give you their right arm not to have to say some of the things they say. Uh, 
But I think it's an open and shut case that predictions are met. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Blanton. I'm uh, with the North Texas Skeptics, which is a, uh, a local nonprofit organization. I've uh, known Don Patton for over 10 years. I go to his meetings. Uh, I've been going since about 1989. I kind of feel like uh, Einstein's uh, fictitious chauffeur, who chauffeured uh, Dr. Einstein around to all these lectures. And he sat in the back of the room listening to the lectures so long that pretty soon he was able to give them himself. And uh, I, want, I want to go ahead and tell the rest of the joke now, but I'll get into, the, get into this talk. Uh, back here at the table, we have uh, Danny Barnett. Danny Barnett uh, will, give you, will give away uh, everything from the North Texas Skeptics is absolutely free. Uh, uh, Danny will give you copies of the newsletter. He'll tell you how to uh, join the North Texas Skeptics. I have brought copies of the presentation plus some uh, uh, other material on CD-ROMs. I only bought, brought about 10 CD-ROMs. You're going to have to share it, guys. Afterwards, uh, in fact, right now, if you were to log on right now, you can get a copy of this uh, presentation off our website. So uh, jot this down. If you don't get a copy of the presentation on CD-ROM, you can just uh, jot this down and log on and get a copy later on. So uh, what I'm going to say is that the fossil record uh, is uh, not more compatible with the model of creation uh, than the model of evolution. Well, what are we talking about? When we got started in this, nobody ever said, well, what is the model for creation? What is the model for evolution? Uh, we just assumed that everybody knew what this meant. Uh, we never did define the terms. It's kind of a, a backward way to get into uh, a debate. But here we go. I get to define it. And I'm going to say that the creation model is a myth. It's based on the Bible. The creation model that Don talks about, that he, uh, that he preaches at his meetings every month, are all biblical based. <coughs> First, and the second thing I'll say is there is no such thing as a model of evolution. Uh, this, the so-called model of evolution, once again, is uh, just a bit of fiction. And I'm going to give you some illustrative examples. We'll go a page up. Oops. Okay, the mythical uh, creation model is based on the Bible. And here's what it is. The Earth and the whole universe were created by a supernatural person all about the same time. Problem is, there are two contradictory versions of it. If you go to Genesis 1.1 to 1.31, there's one version. You go to Genesis 2, there's another version. They don't reconcile. They tell a different story. Uh, but all of them have one thing in common, that there was a worldwide flood that accounts for the known geological formations. Uh, oh, here we go. Here's the Genesis. Genesis myth number one. Day one, sky, earth, light. That's a real, all of you, I'm sure everybody here has read Genesis, or you probably wouldn't be in this room. So I'm not going to go ahead and read the whole thing to you. Uh, oops. All right. <clears throat> Myth number two is that, uh, as you see, it's different. Earth and the heavens start out as misty, then Adam, the first man on the desolate, uh, desolate earth, then the plants, and then the animals. And then he, the first woman created from Adam's rib. Um, now, the Bible accounts for the fossil record. Really? First of all, there's no mention of continents or anything beyond about a 400 mile radius of what is now Jerusalem. There is no mention of plate tectonics in the Bible. There's no mention of fossils at all. Trilobites are completely ab absent in the, in the biblical record. The Bible doesn't mention trilobites once. To uh, geologists and paleontologists, trilobites are a big thing. How did the Bible miss this? Whatever happened to the dinosaurs? They're not in the Bible either. And to say nothing of Australopithecus. And the Bible is a complete dud when it comes to explaining the fossil record. What is the mythical model of evolution? Well, I'm going to disappoint you. It's really, it's only science. It's just hundreds and thousands of real scientists, people who uh, who've gone to college, worked real hard, got degrees, uh, spend their lifetime in careers working, doing real science, and developing this, uh, uh, this science. They developed the science of cosmology, developed the science of geology, paleontology, biology, and never once going back and referring to some um, magical person to explain everything. 
Surprise, guess what? Evolution and modern geology were developed by creationists. James Hutton and Charles Lyell were creationists. They developed uh, the modern science of geology. Charles Darwin was a creationist up until he made his trip and, uh, and began to study, um, uh, to study the various uh, uh, fossils and, uh, and, and other examples, rather uh, <coughs> specimens that he collected on his trip and developed the modern uh, science uh, of evolution or the, the evolutionary theory, which really, I guess, as far as Charles, Charles Darwin is concerned, they develop uh, the idea of natural selection because evolution has a, been a, is an idea that has been around for thousands of years. What is true? Well, it's not the Bible. The, first of all, Adam and Eve are fictitious. Noah is a fictitious character with no purpose because there was no flood. Abraham, a mythical figure is, as well. Moses, who is Moses? Charlton Heston, as everybody knows. <laughs> Science is true. And I'm going to tell you what is true. First of all, the sun was formed by the collapse of hydrogen and helium gas in, in deep space. The Earth was formed by the accretion of heavy elements. The heavy elements were formed deep within a large star that went critical, formed within a su supernova. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. That is to say it's existed as an accreted object about that time. Life started spontaneously on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago, and we are all descended from that first life. More of what is true. The fossil record reflects this great lineage. We're all descended from common life 3.8 billion years ago, and the fossil record shows this. The fossils of ancient forms are in ancient formations. The fossils of more modern forms do not appear into more until more recent geological formations. Biochemistry, biochemistry furthermore, reinforces this lineage and without contradiction. There is no contradiction anywhere of the fossil record by modern bio biochemistry. And this is through, for example, analysis of DNA and protein sequences. Why is the creation model false? Because creationism wants a young Earth. But the Earth is old. Uh, origins of uh, layered sediment, including barbs, which I'll explain, uh, Green River formation. Uh, oh, you know, here's a list of things that I'll get to if I have time. This material is taken from this website here. So when you get a copy of the presentation, you can log on and get this material yourself. Here are barbs. You don't think the Earth is old? Geologists will tell you about barbs. Barbs show how um, early, uh, yearly dates like tree rings do. Seasonal changes within a lake, within an ancient lake, uh, stream <coughs> flowing into, uh, into the lake, uh, deposited layers of sediment, a different color for a different season. Year after year, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, each couplet representing one year. Some formations show 10 million couplets. Now this isn't to say that all of these are invariably one year per couplet, but, they, but the ones that do stack up much more uh, easily, much more time than the Bible will allow for. The, ge the geological record shows multiple glaciations. Uh, once again, these are quotes from a website, and here's the, here's the reference, you have to go back and, uh, and refer to this for the rest of the text. Uh, shows the multiple glaciations, and I'll get to that. Um, uh, Lake or, or division uh, gilides uh, are sandwiched between overlying 500 meter thick uh, marine shell, shales and underlying sandstones and clay beds and the 300 to 400 meter thick uh, uh, layer what above it. <coughs> the tillites range from a few meters to 200 meters thick. These tillites are soils that are produced by the glaciation process. The tillites take a long time to form. They're formed by the glaciers, and there are multiple layers of them. You're going to have to ask yourself if the creation model is true, if all of these uh, geological strata were formed in one great big flood or a series of floods or even just a, 
uh, a number of, of, of events that are spread over a, a few years or a few hundred years or a few thousand years, they're not going to be able to account for this. Here is a diagram that I've drawn. It shows on the bottom a marine sediment. On top of the, on top of the marine sediment is a glacial pillite, which was formed by a glacier. On top of that is another marine sediment. Uh, the idea of this forming uh, during, uh, during a few years, a few thousand years, especially, especially uh, during a, a time of a hundred days flood is fairly absurd. Now, I haven't shown you everything. There are cases where we have multiple stacks of this, uh, where this goes on more than this. It shows multiple glaciation periods uh, interspersed with periods of marine sediment. Uh, angular unconformities. This is evidence of an old earth, the angular unconformities. The exposure shown above, the picture you just saw, is similar to what, uh, what James Hutton saw. The sedimentary rocks below were formed horizontally. And then later, a tectonic event lifted them. And they tilted. And now we had all of these layers that had been horizontal at an angle. And then erosion and other forces scraped them off till the upper surface was nearly level. And a new surface formed on top of that. This is not something that you would find happening in a 100 days flood. And uh, to make a long story short, you can read all of it. This is, a, this is the one of the things that gave James Hutton the idea, convinced him that the earth was very old. His interpretation of the angular unconformity was thus a watershed in the history of geology, absolutely refuting the idea of a worldwide flood causing all of uh, these geological formations. This is another argument. If it was God's purpose to make everything, why did he, why did he go through all of this process, build up all these layers, and then wear them down, put them at an angle, saw them off, put more layers on top of them? It's a nice argument. I like that argument. Weathering and erosion. Some soils take a long time to form. We have, we have uh, layers of certain kinds of paleo soils that take millions of years to form. It's just completely incompatible with being formed during a, uh, a worldwide flood. Salt deposits. We have salt deposits that are thousands of feet thick. The salt is formed uh, when the salt water comes into a shallow basin and is allowed to dry up over periods of thousands and millions of years. And then we have, uh, then we have carbonates on top of that, and then in some cases I think we have salt layers on top of the carbonates. This is another thing that's completely incompatible with a, a hundred, year, hundred day old flood uh, that's causing all these marine, for, or these uh, geological formations. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. I'll use this material later on when we get back to it. DNA of, uh, of humans and other animals. I kind of touched on this, touched on, uh, on uh, protein differences between different species. I'll get back to that during the rebuttal period. The bottom line is, based on the sequence of amino acids in carbonic <coughs> and hydrate one, I, uh, you can more or less form this tree. And this, based on the, uh, in fact, scientists do this, uh, based on the, uh, on the differences of the amino acids, common amino acids, but in uh, different forms for the different organisms, they can uh, get a very good idea of how far back they branched off. Don talked about the lack of branching, and yet when we look at the uh, biological evidence, the biochemical evidence, you see the branching. And it's not only here in the uh, amino acid sequences, it's also in the DNA. Evolution makes sense of homologies. Richard Owen, who was, as I recall, a creationist, in fact, uh, introduced the term homology to refer uh, to the structural similarities among organisms. The homologies bear out the branching structure of, uh, of all the organisms, the, the branching relationship of the living organisms. Evolution makes sense of the homologies. Why would certain cave-dwelling fish have degenerate eyes that cannot see? It's because their ancestors 
once lived outside in the light and needed the eyes. Once more, I'll defer the genetic code to later. Uh, evolution, uh, the genetic code or protein coding genes is nearly universal in the two kinds of uh, cells. The, <coughs> here we go, I'm trying to pronounce this word, uh, the eukaryotes and the uh, prokaryotes. Uh, we are uh, made of eukaryotic uh, cells, that is to say, we're, our cells have developed a kind of nuclei with the nucleus wall. Uh, bacteria are uh, prokaryotes. The genetic code is uh, homologous among living organisms. It is similar despite the fact that there exist many equally good genetic codes. In other words, you could have built us a different way. You could take a, you could take a chemistry set. If you were good enough in chemistry, you had a good enough library, you could build a human being from scratch. You don't have to use exactly the same sequence of, uh, of DNA to to construct a human being. As long as it produces the correct proteins in the cell at the right time, you can generate a human being. And he will obviously have no lineage in common with all these other animals uh, in the world. And yet, we do. When you examine our biochemistry, you see that we are related very distantly to all of these other uh, life forms through a common ancestry. Oh, combined evolution. For people who say there's no uh, observed uh, evolution, here's something. Although the fossil record is often poor and incomplete, there are certain wait, <laughs> These aren't my words. Look at the thing down the bottom. Uh, this, this is the source for this material, so I'm not taking credit for this. Uh, the fossil record is often poor and incomplete. There are certain deposits where sedimentary layers remain in nearly continuous series. Fossils from these series provide direct evidence of evolutionary change. Sheldon examined a series of sedimentary layers from the Ordovician period about 500 million years ago containing trilobite fossils, which are now extinct. And the samples were obtained from every three million years, and the number of ribs in each species of trilobite changed over time. Some of these changes over time were so large that the animals at the end of the series are assigned a new genus. For those who say that there are no intermediate, there are no uh, intermediate uh, <coughs> fossils, this is this is the counter example. The trilobites are so well preserved. Uh, I'm not even going to get into uh, for, <coughs> for for one thing because it's hard for me to pronounce the word for for mineralophora evolution. For 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 mineralophora are little one-celled animals and they produce a hard shell and uh, we uh, know about them through their shells. I'm going to uh, move forward and show you the picture. Here it is, uh, the illustration from the website. I advise people to go back, examine this material yourself. The creationists usually do not invite people at their meetings to go back and examine the source material. Uh, I been going to the uh, creationist meetings for over 10 years. I very seldom see these guys go back and examine the source material, and for good reason. Well, evolution, oh, the evidence. Uh, Xenonics, uh, here, here's the, uh, the known sequence of whale evolution from land animals to modern whales. The Xenonics, uh, the Pachycetus, the Angulocetus, of the road, the road of Cetus, the Basilosaurus, and the Duragon. If I have enough time, I'll get into some of this. Here's a uh, skull reconstruction. This was a land animal, uh, which is uh, thought to be uh, an ancestor of modern whales. And this is the uh, Magnesius uh, skull reconstruction, uh, which is a later uh, descendant along the, the lineage. Uh, here is the uh, angular sequence of net hands. I don't, <coughs> I'm not uh, familiar with that particular uh, form. Uh, this is a uh, reconstruction of a full skeleton. Uh, notice the hind legs. The whales have hind legs, yet here is an ancestor of a whale with hind legs. Uh, the Rhodocetus, once again, still has hind legs, but if you notice, 
that uh, he's more adapted for swimming than he is for walking on land. I just kind of thought that uh, this animal was not very good on land at all, and probably not. And here's another uh, reconstruction. This is a, uh, most likely this is a, a, this is all that they found in one particular fossil. And then here's the Bachelorsaurus. This is, as I understand, this is the official uh, fossil of the state of Mississippi and the state of Alabama. Um, there are a lot of them found in this country, in the southeastern United States. Um, <coughs> this was a, uh, a completely marine animal and uh, was uh, uh, very close to modern real. I'm going to allow that scientists think that this guy has no modern descendants. Uh, Bachelosaurus, uh, many real scientists think Bachelosaurus died out and did not leave any descendants, but he was along the, uh, the lineage uh, that, uh, that resulted in the modern way. And there's the Uridon. And you notice, down there below is, uh, below the skeleton toward the back, what are those? Those are the vestigial feet. The whale living in the ocean now no longer needs feet. Uh, natural selection is deselecting these feet. The feet are going away. And, uh, and this is what we see in modern whales today. We see an animal that supposedly was created at one time to live in the ocean, and yet for some reason he was given useless feet. These useless feet uh, are the remnants of, uh, of his ancestors. This is what he got from his uh, land-dwelling ancestors. In fact, it's, uh, maybe if I have time later on, I'll get into uh, the animal that we're pretty sure was the real ancestor of modern whales, uh, which was an, un an ungulate, a grazing, um, a two-toed, uh, or in fact, two-hooked animal. The closest relative to the modern whale that we find on land today is most likely the hippopotamus or something like something in the same family. So I'm going to uh, wipe this down now, and um, and then I'll turn the uh, talk. Oh wait, I get I get to do the rebuttal now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, 15 seconds. Right. Okay. No, no, I get to do the rebuttal now. Oh, okay. He, all right. He can do it. I was beginning to get a little bit disappointed. I thought we weren't going to be getting to the fossil record. He finally did get to that. I thought we'd agreed to debate the fossil record, though most of it had nothing to do with the fossil record. It reminded me of the, the write-up in the Nashville, Tennessee, several years ago when Dr. Gish debated one of the professors there at the University of Texas. And the reporter, who was an evolutionist, wrote up the debate and said, Dr. Gish is the one that talked about the fossil evidence, whereas the opponent uh, thumped the Bible, and that's what he talked about, and that was the reverse of what he had expected, which is pretty much what we witnessed here uh, this afternoon. Um, a myth based on the Bible. Well, I'm not going to debate the Bible this afternoon. I agreed and signed a paper saying I was going to debate the fossil record, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about. If you'd like to debate the Bible, I'll be glad to sign propositions for that. But I'm going to keep my word and debate what I said we were going to debate. Uh, it's tempting <laughs> to answer some of that, which is very easily answered, but uh, I'm going to keep my agreement. Uh, a major portion of it, maybe uh, a third of the presentation, was on the age of the earth. Well, that may indirectly relate to the issue of the fossil record, but that's not the fossil record. Um, he talks about varves and just uh, gives the a priori statement that uh, proves the old age. It takes a year, maybe a little bit more sometimes. Uh, in the secular literature, that has been severely discounted. The Green River Shale shows catfish with adipose tissue four and five inches thick that are covered with dozens of these varves. Now, it's going to lay there for years and years and years. Adipose tissue still preserved. Now, that had to be preserved rapidly, curved quickly, when, I mean, covered quickly. Uh, at Mount St. Helens, uh, there was uh, over 600 feet of quarter-inch laminate laid down one afternoon at about 150 miles an hour. 
600 feet of quarter inch laminate. It's rock. You hit it with a hammer. It's hard as a, it rings like a bell. Um, it does not take a long time to do that. Tillite takes as long as it takes for the glacier to melt. There is no factor in tillite itself that requires age. That's just an affirmation unsupported. And likewise with angular unconformities, if you have the turbulence of a flood, which was a subject you brought up, wasn't my uh, doing, then you do exactly that kind of thing. It is a direct prediction of that. Um, it doesn't take millions of years to form soil. Uh, that's just, what was the evidence that he gave for that? Anybody hear him? Just asserted it. Uh, a number of volcanic islands have been completely viable within 50, at least 100 years. Uh, you look at Mount St. Helens, the area that was sterile as the moonscape, as it was described, is now blossoming and blooming and doing just great. And it hasn't taken millions of years, thousands of years, hundreds of years. The soil is doing fine, though it was completely wiped away. Um, he talked about the phylogeny of primates and says this shows evolution. <laughs> There's an awful, awful lot of evolutionary assumption involved in arranging the phylogenies, but, and it depends on which authorities you quote to say how they line up. Now, you've got some that line them this way and some that line them that way. Colin Patterson is not a lightweight. He's curator of the largest fossil museum in the world, British Museum of Natural History. He spoke on that at the American Museum of Natural History, quoted in science. He said, the prediction is made that these phylogenies would appear out of the biochemical evidence and the prediction is precisely falsified. You have predictions of kinship that are bizarre, that do not fit. Uh, and so that's, uh, I just deny that that is the case. You can see some that would line up, and actually when you look at the, the interior structure, you see similarities. That gets back to the point that we were making a moment ago. When you look at the entire picture, you see a very different thing. I want to uh, move to similarities here uh, for just a second, and uh, he mentioned the chromosomes. This is not an argument he made. Well, actually, he hinted at it. Let's turn this on, uh, Ross. Uh, this is in a number of textbooks where they argue about, now again, we're not on the fossil record, but I'm following somebody who's off track. Uh, you look at the, the number of chromosomes and it, it looks like evolution. You look at the whole picture though, when you get more information as we've gotten now, we see tobacco's got more than us. Uh, the fern has 480, the turkey has 82, we've just got 46. Uh, in terms of amount of DNA, uh, humans have something like 3 billion base pairs. Uh, but you look at this particular plant, I won't try to pronounce it, he has 125 billion, the lungfish 139 billion, uh, another plant at 160, here's a couple of amoeba that are way off the chart uh, in terms of amount of DNA. Well, I'm not sure that really says a whole lot about evolution, but we see arguments like that being made from time to time. Uh, Ross, uh, just cut that. Uh, he did get to the fossil record at the end, trilobites. Prove evolution. Trilobites are found at certain levels, and that's exactly right. Many would affirm it is due to ecological zonation. Certain ones lived at this level, certain ones lived at that level. They would be buried where they lived. They are trilobites when they start. Some of the most beautiful, ornate, fanciest trilobites are right at the bottom of that Cambrian. Those are the complex organisms they were talking about. When they get through the evolutionary sequence that's assumed, it's still a beautiful trilobite. They have ribs that change, uh, not necessarily because they evolve one another. There's a variety of them. Uh, we see that in varieties of horses. Uh, you see the ribs coming and going and coming and going. There's not this pattern that branches toward greater complexity at all. In fact, the greatest complexity is at the bottom. With foraminifera, we find exactly the same thing. In fact, we have found the exact sequence that you see in the textbooks in the ocean today, zoned by temperature zonation. Certain ones live at this temperature, certain ones live at that temperature. That's how they got buried, and so it's reflected in uh, the fossil record just that way. In terms of whale evolution, 
many of these pictures he was showing here are beautiful pictures. The problem is you've got two or three bones in some instances that have been interpreted in this manner. He did not tell you what the original source material was at all. Many paleontologists will just get up and fight virulently against the idea that these are whales anyway. You've got a few ankle bones, a few tail bones here and there. Uh, if, if they have feet and they're running around, I, it's difficult to call it a whale, some would say. Maybe not just for that reason. It is controversial even among evolutionary paleontologists. Uh, the vestigial feet are used to anchor muscles. They are very necessary, according to the anatomist, the assumption that they're vestigial is just an assertion and is an illustration of some of the, the real bad science that comes as a result of evolution. I might give an example of that if I can find, uh, I'm looking uh, here, not seeing it right now. Uh, we did have uh, one who wrote up uh, some material that I presented at the uh, skeptics meeting. Uh, this was Ms. Vaughn. And uh, he mentioned uh, the vestigial organs, but uh, the appendix came up at the meeting, and Patton claims, she says, that the doctors have now learned removing the appendix, let's turn this on, uh, regularly is the wrong thing to do because we need them to produce antibodies. She says, first off, the appendix uh, does not now, never has in our evolutionary past produced antibodies. It just hangs around. It's the Cato calin of organs, becomes inflamed. That's all it's good for. I've done medical search for 11 years. I'm at Southwestern and all of this. Um, here's a recent article. Four years, uh, for years, appendix is credited to very little physiological function. We know it serves an important purpose, the fetus of the young and the adults. In the past, it was routinely removed during surgeries. Uh, now the appendix is spared. And then a later article, among human adults, the appendix is now thought to be involved primarily in immune functions, shown to function as lymph node organs in the production of antibodies which is exactly what I said. Now, I don't have 11 years of medical research, uh, but I evidently knew more than her than blinded by her evolutionary philosophy, which has mutilated, butchered generations because they assumed this thing was useless based on their evolutionary philosophy. That's one of the consequences. This is the way you test a model. What are the predictions? Do they come true? We predicted it would be found to be useful. They predicted it would not, and they were wrong. Uh, the tillites, the varves, the trilobites, the, the few things that he did mention in the fossil record by no means prove his point, and most of it wasn't relevant uh, to the fossil record at all. Thank you. Uh, Don mentioned uh, the, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and the Cambridge explosion. Uh, he did not tell you the full story. Uh, once again, like I said, I've been to uh, the MEOS meetings uh, for the last 10 or 12 years. And I see this time and time again. Uh, tell a quick quote out of a famous book by a real scientist, someone who actually uh, does work in the field, someone who actually has, has a degree in the field. And then take a quick quote out of his book, take it out of context, and put it up there. And the guy seems to be saying uh, the opposite of what he says if you go read the rest of the book. In fact, we did that one time. Uh, Jeff O. Berger and I went to the VOS meeting uh, a number of years ago. I think it was back in 1992. Uh, Don gave us the handouts from his talks. There were a number of quotes uh, from these handouts. Jeff O. Berger took the quotes over uh, to the University of Texas at Dallas Library and looked up the source material. In many cases, uh, pertinent passages had been deliberately uh, deleted passages which explain that the author was saying exactly the opposite of what the speaker wanted the audience to think. In one case, the most egregious example I've ever seen, three phrases were taken from a couple of paragraphs. They were put together in a slightly different order, not in the same sequence that the original author had placed them. And then this was put up on the, um, on the screen uh, for the audience to see. And it had uh, the author, a real scientist, seemed to be saying the opposite uh, of what he actually said in the full article. Now, since I cannot anticipate what the speaker 
will bring up at the debate. I couldn't bring all of this material, but it's all online. Uh, you have the North Texas Skeptics website. Log on. Uh, uh, look up our newsletters. All our newsletters back in 1987 are online. Uh, you can pull them up. You can see the original article with the original text from uh, Don Patton's handouts, the original text from the actual source, and you can make the comparison yourself. So, if Stephen J. Gould seems to be saying that Stephen J. Gould, one of the biggest supporters of evolution these days, uh, seems to be saying that evolution is a bunch of hogwash, then maybe you need to go check the original material. I have a copy of his book, Wonderful Life, which was quoted here. Uh, I have not, I cannot immediately bring up the original passage, which uh, you have someone who uses this kind of approach, a definite advantage. Uh, it's up to you people as thinking individuals to go and chase down the original material yourself, get a copy of Don's handouts, go back to the original sources, go to our website, you will, you will see it on our website following this debate. One of the things is, golly, I wish Don hadn't done that. I didn't need that much help. He brought up Glenn Gish's foolish business about the garter snake and the donkey milk and the butter bean. Uh, if you care to, if I don't have that on our website, I will shortly. Uh, this has been, this is very famous. They've been trying to get uh, Glenn Gish to retract this bit of nonsense for about the last 20 years. And he keeps, I don't know, Glenn Gish's is abandoned it entirely. It's still in his published works. Um, Don Patton needs to dump it because uh, it's, it's not well supported. The, the, uh, it's been well refuted. I'm checking my pen. How am I doing? Okay. And I, I encourage you to look it up. Once again, go to our website. We're a public service organization. We provide information. We go get information from real scientists, people who actually do the work, we put it on our website. We put links to it so you can go and read the original source. And I have up here just a little bit. Uh, I noticed I didn't mention the appendix. This is within the argument in the way it's called a straw man. Uh, I'm not going to stand up and say, we don't need the appendix. Uh, maybe we do. I'm not an MD. Uh, but I didn't bring it up, and I didn't use it. You bring up something like the appendix when you don't have a very good argument. You bring up something that can, you can easily defeat. A straw man is really not a very good fighter. You put up a straw man and say, look, this is the enemy, and then you destroy it. Which, in the case of the appendix, is maybe easier to do than the vestigial uh, feet of the whale. If the vestigial feet of the whale were put there just to anchor some muscles, then why do they look like feet? Why do they have toes? <clears throat> why, why, don't they, why isn't there something that functions better at anchoring the muscles uh, than some, left, some feet that were left over from the whale's uh, land ancestors? Um, he says he has some, uh, some uh, real geologists and paleontologists looking at some things and saying, these are not whales. That's true. Whales are descended from things that are not whales. So what's the problem there? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the preserved fish in the Green River. Once again, there's a link to that on our website. Uh, if you follow some of the material in the handouts that I gave you, uh, you have uh, real scientists, people who actually do work in this field, talking about the anaerobic conditions uh, that existed uh, in, in, on occasion, not always, that allow uh, a specimen to be preserved long enough uh, to be covered by uh, several layers of yearly barbs. Uh, the chromosome count foolishness. This is easily the buck. I don't even know why Don brought this up. Uh, any good uh, uh, biochemist uh, can put this down. Obviously, there are some more primitive life forms like uh, certain kinds of worms. There's a worm that I know, I can't remember his name exactly. It's got more chromosomes than the human being, of course. What does that say? Uh, <coughs> My advice, rather than listen to a creationist lecture, go back and learn some of the material. Back in 1989, I started attending uh, the Miel's lectures. I started hearing these weird arguments, and I thought to myself, you know, I need to learn more about this stuff. I was thinking, I was telling Jim 
earlier before the meeting, I need to go get a degree in geology. But then I thought, T.I. won't pay for that, but they will pay for a degree in uh, physics. So I went back to school and I got a master's degree in physics. By the question I asked to the creationist, what are you willing to do? You have these questions, why don't you go back to school, learn some of these things that you're talking about, so you no longer talk from ignorance, get a real degree, and, and then and put yourself, do, do research alongside uh, real scientists doing real science. I know a creationist who's a real scientist. He came to the meeting one time, and he said, look, guys, I'm a geologist. He says, I believe in God. I believe God created all this, but this young earth business is a bunch of crap. You, you send your kids to college, they're going to learn that all this stuff that you've been teaching them in church is a bunch of crap. One of the persons in the NEOS meeting says, well, then don't send them. And I guess that's the creationist approach to the whole thing. Thank you. Uh. John mentions he's been going to the meetings for some time, which is, of course, true, and then writing it up, and it is online. But what he has online is <laughs> disgusting. Let me show you. He just doesn't get it regarding the quotes. Here he says, and this is quoting from the newsletter online, where we have been able to cross-check the citations against the actual text, we have noted the classic out-of-context stunt is being pulled to make it appear that mainstream science supports the Mias view. Well, I think I may have gotten him off of that in the presentation just a moment ago. These are evolutionists. They don't support the Mias view. Absolutely not so. That's my point. I want you to know they're antagonistic witnesses. That makes their evidence, their, their testimony stronger. No, we are not saying that, but this is what he says we said that isn't true. He gives a specific example. Radiometric dating methods, says Don Patton, for example, are just about worthless, even according to the anti-creationist scientists, such as William D. Stanfield, the author of The Science of Evolution. According to him, I said, Stanfield said, these things are worthless. Uh, and you can get that impression from what he wrote because he gives all of the reasons why they're not that dependable but he devoutly believes in them. He doesn't think they're worthless. In Patton's handout that he mentions, and that he mentions on the website, Patton says this, uh, under the heading, this is my heading, Stanfield's answer, all the above methods for dating the age of the earth, and he's referring to young age methods, and he acknowledges there are a lot of reasons for a young earth. They're all questionable though, he says, and then here's what I said about his conclusion, a method that appears to have much greater reliability for, term for determining absolute ages of rocks is that of radiometric dating. Now John says, I said he said they were worthless. What I actually said was he believed in it devoutly. He just doesn't get it. And he misrepresents, obviously, as uh, the lady who talked about the appendix did. To and, and of course he brought up the vestigial organs with the whales. Why aren't they this way? Why aren't they that way? At this point, he's playing theologian. That's not the subject. <laughs> Theologically, you might say it ought to be this way. I don't think John's had training in theology. He might have gotten a lot of training in physics, but he's lacking, sadly, in theology. And I'd be glad to try to sit down and discuss that subject, but that's not the subject today. Um, uh, he talked about Gish needing to, uh, Ross, let's, needing to retract the nonsense about the snake cholesterol. He gave no evidence. In fact, I don't even, didn't even hear him say the snake didn't have cholesterol. Is that what you're saying? That's all. Uh, if you're saying the snake doesn't have cholesterol, you're going to be very foolishly embarrassed. The snake certainly does, and uh, so do the other fact. I, I stand by that chart just as it was presented, and just saying it's nonsense, of course, he presented the evidence, didn't he? No, uh, that wasn't the case. He said, I misrepresented, and I had all of these things where it said exactly the opposite. Well, where's the example? It would have been, if he's got an example like that, don't you think he would have brought it and shown it to you? 
Uh, I can show you an example specific, as you just saw, where he claimed I misrepresented when I did not. Now, all of the quotes that I've used, he says we don't go to the original sources, are back there on the back table. You multiply them by about four, that's there with them. Original sources, you go check for yourself. I have been, you can go. I want you to take that material and go look at it. Now, he said we don't go to the original sources and then said I gave out handouts with the original sources on it. Isn't that interesting? He knew better when he said it to start with. But a whole page uh, of the original sources with all of the quotes, you go see if they're, would I just misrepresent the thing entirely and then say, here, you go look at it? Uh, well, you go find out. Obviously, these men are revolutionists. You can get upset when you look at this and say, ah, these men are revolutionists after all. Well, yes, that's the point. But they acknowledge points that are very detrimental to their position, and their acknowledging it makes it much more significant. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy that Don brought part of the article from our newsletter back in May of 1992. I guess if I had been a psychic, I would have brought the entire article. It would have been very interesting to read. However, you can still go read the article. I stand by what I said. I was at the meeting. Don gave the presentation. He deliberately left the audience with the opinion that the author uh, was against evolution against radial, uh, radio metric dating, when the author really was not an enemy of radio metric dating. The author was uh, picking uh, some fine aspects of it. Uh, he obviously had some heartburn with some cases where it's misapplied. Uh, once again, you got a copy of the link to the website. Please go check it out. Uh, on the website, there is an email link to me. You can send me an email right back to me in case I'm wrong. I'm wrong. This is almost April of 2002. The thing has been out there for 10 years, and we've never gotten anyone who has had any heartburn with this. Maybe we'll get some in, in the future. Maybe we'll, we'll begin to get some. Uh, the deal about Dwayne Gish and the butter beans and the garter snake and the, um, who was it he didn't? Who else did you didn't have cholesterol <laughs> and, the, and the cholesterol? Um, I, I'll stand by that. And if I don't have a link to that on the website, we'll certainly put, put it. Uh, when I said uh, that the creationists don't go back and check the original, I don't mean that Don doesn't read the original. Don reads the original. As far as I can tell, Don reads uh, Science, uh, Science Magazine, the magazine of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, of which I'm a member and have a subscription. He reads Science News because I see many quotes from that. Don reads a lot of good science. The question is, why doesn't he put it all in his presentation? These articles are written by real scientists uh, who, who've gone to school, studied hard, worked all the way through, taken all the quizzes, gone to work in the field, made it their life's work, and worked earnestly for years and compiled this information and written these items, <coughs> written these articles. This is where the real science is. The real science is not found in these books that you see sold at the creationist meetings. Uh, they're not found, real science is not found on these creationist websites. Uh, creationists uh, don't have any science. You'll notice we've been here uh, since approximately a little after 3.30. Uh, Don has not put up any science uh, that was uh, in support of the creationist viewpoint. He's been attacking uh, real science by quoting real scientists out of context, very little, very little context for the entire quote. He says that we do not give our sources. I'm sorry that I can't go through and read my entire presentation from beginning to end. Uh, you have a copy of it. I've uh, given copies on CD to Danny back here. Uh, you can get a copy of the CD for free. We don't sell anything. We're a public service organization. Uh, it's all right now. It's on the website right now. You can go get a copy of it. You can see all the sources, all the source material. 
Uh, you don't, you don't have some heartburn uh, with the paleo soils. Uh, some very good scientists, real scientists doing real work, have determined how long it takes to form uh, bauxite, for example, by the weathering of exposed rocks. Uh, these are very slow processes. They cannot be accelerated. And yet we have instances of this soil inside the soil is where it was originally formed, not washed down from somewhere else, and it is, it is as many, many feet thick. All right, are, are we out of time? Okay. Uh, I'll just wind the, uh, kind of, I'll wind the dialogue down right now, and then we can get on to the question and answer period. Thank you very much for coming out.